Let's talk for a few minutes about the basics of vaccines. Uh, a vaccine is really just a suspension of either whole intact pathogens or just fractions of those pathogens. And the purpose is to induce immunity. Specifically, it's to develop uh, a memory response in the form of memory T cells, memory B cells, and even some circulating antibodies so that upon secondary exposure to the exact same antigens, the response will be so rapid and so thorough that the host will not have to experience disease. Really what you're doing is creating a memory response without ever having to experience the initial infection. It's quite ingenious when you think about it. Terms vaccination and immunization are interchangeable, by the way. So the goal, increased BNT memory cells with receptors for a specific pathogen. You guys know that more specifically, it's a specific antigen and even a specific epitope of a specific antigen without experience experiencing the disease. <clears throat> this graph here is nice because it shows you how intense a secondary response can be. And, and this, is, this is whether you, your primary response, or primary exposure is due to um, a vaccine, an artificial uh, response, or it's due to an actual infection. You see that uh, on the left, you've got the sort of the magnitude of the immune response. And on the x-axis, you've got time. So the initial antigen exposure, let's say, happened at zero days. There's an immune response. And uh, if it was a, a true infection, then uh, at some point that infection was cleared. And they show that at 100 days, you're re-exposed to the antigen. This is just, you know, hypothetical. Say at 100 days, you're re-exposed. And look at the, the spike in that secondary response and how slow it is for that secondary response to come back down again. And this pattern is true whether it's a vaccine for your primary exposure or if it's the actual live pathogen that makes you sick for your primary exposure. Therefore, what we're trying to do is skip that primary exposure and the illness that goes along with it and prepare our immune system just for that secondary response that you see on the right. And there are five common vaccine strategies. I'm just going to introduce them to you briefly, give you an example of each of those. The first, and they each have trade-offs, and that's important for us to recognize. The first is called an attenuated live vaccine. This is where live pathogens are introduced into the body, but they've been weakened through mutation. And there's a variety of ways we can do that. But you've got a live organism. Um, for example, the, um, the nasal mist seasonal flu vaccine is live but it's been grown up in chicken eggs for so many generations that it's now much better at infecting chicken embryo epithelial tissue than it is at infecting human uh, respiratory tract uh, epithelial tissues. So there are, there are tricks that can be used in the lab to attenuate or moderate the virulence of a pathogen. Now, there's trade-offs, right? The, the pluses to this is a huge effectiveness rate, something like 95% effectiveness. Uh, a very intense response and great immunological memory. In many cases, this brings lifelong immunity. Now, we know with influenza, because it's an RNA virus that, um, that mutates very rapidly, you're not going to get lifelong immunity from that. But from others like MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, often you're going to get lifelong immunity because it's attenuated, it's live, it's the closest thing you're going to get besides getting an actual infection. The trade-off, hopefully, is obvious. The risk is higher. Live microorganisms run a higher risk of causing an actual infection. And so it's riskier from that perspective, but the payoff is higher as well. Inactivated or killed vaccines. These are pathogens that have been killed um, typically by chemicals like formaldehyde or phenol. You guys studied how those work earlier in the semester. Or in some cases, it's just a subunit of the pathogen. These are called acellular uh, vaccines, where uh, only a portion of the pathogen has been used to create the vaccine. Um, the, the typical seasonal influenza vaccine, the one that's administered parenterally with a shot, is uh, most often an inactivated killed vaccine in something like formaldehyde. Um, the acellular pertussis vaccine for whooping cough is one where only fragments that uh, research has shown provide the strongest uh, antigenic response, immunological response. Um, only those fragments are administered to the patient. Now, as you might expect, uh, the risk is a lot lower 
here, right? If, if they're dead or you've only got fragments of the pathogen, they're a lot less likely to cause any sort of disease. The trade-off is they tend to be antigenically weak uh, and they require boosters or something called adjuvants. Adjuvants are other chemicals that seem to uh, stimulate a stronger uh, immunological response when they are uh, they're co-injected along with the inactivated pathogens. So again, trade-offs. Uh, you've lowered your risk now, but you've also lowered the overall effectiveness and uh, and duration of memory. We talked briefly the other day about toxoids. These are inactivated bacterial toxins. Uh, a great example would be the diptet vaccine is inactivated diphtheria toxin and inactivated tetanus toxin. <clears throat> Think about, I'm not going to give you the answer to this now, but this would be worth thinking about before the exam, how a toxoid is going to work. If a toxoid stimulates an immune response, what branch of the immune system is it stimulating? And how does that branch actually go after the toxin? Now, again, because it's inactivated, uh, risk is lower, but it, uh, its effectiveness is also lower. Think about, um, for example, the tetanus shot and, and this sort of common understanding that every 10 years you have to get a booster of that because memory is a lot shorter when you've just got this tiny little protein and not an entire pathogen to expose to your immune system. Conjugated vaccines, we talked about these in class. Uh, this is when a weak antigen from one pathogen is covalently bound to a strong antigen from another. Hib conjugate vaccine, the Haemophilus influenza type B, is the most popular one and, and the best understood. Uh, this is, becomes real important for childhood bacterial vaccines because if you remember, T-independent antigens like uh, polysaccharide capsules that you find on organisms like Haemophilus, Streptococcus, and Neisseria, these three examples down at the bottom, um, they, those T-independent um, uh, antigens are pretty ineffective at stimulating an immune response in children. Their immune system is still developing, and they don't do a good job at, at responding to those. You and I don't do a great job at it either, but uh, in kids it's almost absent. And so what scientists have done is conjugate it, meaning they've covalently linked it to some other strong antigen, usually a good antigenic protein from some other organism. And what you end up doing is building a good immune response, it turns out, to both. And so this is a, a pretty um, serendipitous uh, find that by, by linking these together, we could overcome some of the limitations of, uh, of that T-independent response. So that's all I have for you with the vaccines. I hope that was useful and helpful. And understand that you are responsible for these uh, just as if we'd been talking about them in class.